A very good afternoon and thank you for joining us on Facebook Live. My name is Elliot Danka from Money FM 89.3. Joining me this morning for today's post-budget 2020 panel is my co-host from the Breakfast Huddle, Ryan Huang. So just two days ago, Budget 2020 was announced. Our Deputy Prime Minister called it a unity budget. And really all of this is in the face of dealing with the economic effects of COVID-19. Mm. And this budget aims to help our country weather the uncertainties ahead and have a slew of measures for families, workers, elderly Singaporeans and businesses. And we are talking about a huge package. Oh yeah. $160 billion plan comprising you know, things like two big packages, $5.6 billion yep. worth of a sustainable and support package. And you also have the can support package. Um, the dust has settled after two days. A lot of people sort of digesting all the details of the budget. And for most of it, we hear a lot of positive response. Mm. Well, today we're going to get into a lot of thoughts, thoughts from economists, experts, and even the public. Mind you, REACH has been actively holding listening points across Singapore to gather views on the, pub on the budget. That's right. So, and the public can also submit their views mm. through various uh, feedback channels at the budget website as well as reach us social media platforms. And if you have any questions for our panel, you can also get to our Facebook page and put in your questions, and we'll get to them once this discussion is near the end. And in case you can't be in front of your computer to watch this on Facebook Live, don't worry. Uh, you can listen to the broadcast on Money FM 89.3. It's running at the exact same time. So you could listen to it either in your car or perhaps download our SPH radio app. So make sure you send in your questions a little bit later on. We've got a lot of details to get into. But someone who has been helping us prepare for mm. the budget and speaking to us very often is a good friend of ours. And she's joining us today for this panel discussion. We welcome Miss Indrani Raja, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister for Finance and Education. Ms. Indrani, good afternoon and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me on this program. Most of the time you think that when you gear up to a big event, once the event is done, yay, I can relax a little bit. <laughs> no. But not when it comes to the budget because the work starts now. That's right. With, with, with budget, the work just you deliver the budget and then it's a whole year's worth of work because after you've explained this budget, we've got to start preparing for the next budget. Yeah. Yeah, and Never stops. COS sessions starting next week as yeah. well. Uh, what else can you tell us about the budget? I mean, in terms of the most immediate reactions, what are you hearing? Well, this budget is called the Unity Budget for a reason. It's got something for everybody. And it's also delivered at a time where we are dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. Mm -hmm. So we wanted a budget that would pull everybody together, make sure that we help the right sectors. That's why you have the stabilization support package. But at the same time, position ourselves for the medium and the longer term. That's why you have the transformation uh, and growth package. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, make sure that we take care of Singaporeans. So there's you have the, the, the nurture and care portion. And then we've got to think about the future, yeah. Sus our sustainability, green Singapore, mm. making sure that we adapt to climate change and making sure that we've got enough money to do all of this. Indeed. Um, in fact, uh, Ms. Indrani Raja will be joining us for this panel discussion, which will include the likes of Barnabas Gunn, who is an economist at United Overseas Bank. Joining him is Ajay Sangraneria, who is Deputy Head of Tax at KPMG. Kurt Wee, President of ASME and Chairman SBF SME Committee, as well as Eugene Tan, Associate Professor of Law, Singapore Management University. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. Thank you. Of thank course, you. Uh, budget was two days ago and the dust has settled. Uh, so I would love to hear from you what you've been hearing from your own communities. Um, maybe I'll start with you first, Kurt. Okay. What have you been hearing from the SME community? Because you have your ear very close to the ground. What have they been mm. telling you in terms of reactions? So for the SMEs, uh, if you look at the background, they've just come out from about 18, 24 months of US-China trade war. And really, the situation started plateauing towards the end of last year, and then they got hit by this virus situation. And it's really come on quite fast and furious. Uh, you, all the frontline industries that have been mentioned, hospitality, restaurants, um, you know, F&B operation, retail, mm -hmm. they have seen a, a collapse of their top line by about 40 to 60%. Mm -hmm. And this is actually quite evident because even from the start of the onset of the situation, if you go to the, the malls and you go to some of the public places, you see footfall falling by more than 50%. So there's been a lot of engagement. Uh, and some of these uh, frontline industries, they are quite hard hit. Uh, and then there's some B2B industries as well, and some of the other non-frontline industries, they're also experiencing symptoms that is going to shake them a little bit. 
uh, those industries that are dependent on uh, inventory from China, for example, they are running out in the next one or two months. You know, so contractors are, are preparing because they might have some delays. And uh, some of the other B2B services, they are also seeing the slowdown as well. So the business community is, uh, is uh, quite on the edge because of this uh, impact that's come on quite fast. Mm -hmm. Ajay, KPMG proposed a whole transformation, a uh, 40-page uh, proposition. How satisfied are you with the direction we're taking? So clearly, I mean, for but the budget, the way we see it is that it is not only addressing the immediate need, and uh, the immediate need means the COVID-19 situation. Sure. Uh, when we look at it, the support which is being provided in this year's budget uh, for the immediate need is much, much larger than what we saw in uh, 2003, uh, when the SARS crisis hit us. Mm. So it is much broader. It is very, very well-rounded. It is covering aspects of, uh, you know, need, looking at the needs of workers, the businesses, the specific mm. sectors being targeted. Mm. But what we are very, very pleased about it is that it is not only looking at the immediate needs, but also addressing the needs of the future. And the package of transformation and grow, mm. uh, which the minister has set aside for $8.3 billion is mm. quite sizable as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is really uh, the right thing to do uh, in terms of looking at the immediate needs, but not losing sights on what is needed for the future. Uh, immediate needs are, you know, are immediate pains where you can give painkillers, but the chronic issues of the industry in terms of productivity, in terms of growing beyond Singapore, needs to be continued to be focused on. So we are very pleased that that theme has continued. Mm -hmm. And as you said, we have also been uh, propagating that in our report. Mm -hmm of the need to make Singapore as a transformation capital of Asia yeah. mm. and uh, develop these capabilities to be able to export these capabilities beyond Singapore in the long run. Mm -hmm. So we are very happy to hear that. Mm. And Eugene, you've got your pulse on what the society is feeling, right? What have you been reading from you know, the papers, the comments online? What's been the sense that you've been getting in terms of reaction to the budget? I think it's generally positive. Uh, I think there is something for, for everyone. Uh, the question of whether more could be done will always be there. Mm. Um, but I think when you look at the budget, certainly you know, it seeks to, to address uh, current concerns. I mean, when, when you go around Singapore today, it just doesn't look and feel like Singapore. Right? The malls, the airport, even the universities. <laughs> right? it's, it's, it doesn't look as though we, we have too many people. Uh, so it's, it's a very unusual time, uh, and hopefully the budget helps to uh, boost public confidence, you know, that the government is able to provide the resources first to, mm -hmm. to deal with the COVID-19 outbreak uh, and secondly, you know, to help businesses because I think what is really important is to protect jobs uh, and also ensure that there will be work in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question really is whether the budget will, will have that transformative effect in terms of employers playing their part, right? So, so one hopes that, you know, it will unify the nation. Um, and, and I think, you know, looking at keeping an eye on the future, as uh, the other, um, my colleagues have mentioned, I think it's a very important thing, right? So even as we deal with the current concerns, we must not lose sight of the future. Um, and, and so I think all in, um, it's, it, I call it a blockbuster budget. Um, <laughs> no, but not only that. I mean, you know, yes, there's a budget deficit, but yeah. more than paid for, through the accumulated surpluses, and, and yet mm -hmm. there is still money left mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the kitty mm -hmm. uh, if off-budget measures are needed. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we are in a pretty good, uh, mm -hmm. good situation. Mm -hmm. We've been playing nice. Okay, Barnabas, let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> semi follow-up from what Eugene yeah. said. Yeah. Short-term, semi-long-term questions. Yeah. This looks good, mm -hmm. dealing with the effects of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But once we're out of it, Mm -hmm. once the economy is ready to pick up, and if, let's say, we go through mm -hmm. a recession, mm -hmm. does this make Singapore, mm -hmm. put Singapore in a strong position mm -hmm. to tackle the recovery? It's a huge question. I mean, Sorry, mate. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a huge question. First and foremost, I think the question we should ask ourselves is how long will the COVID-19 outbreak last? And I think a, a, a good answer is no one knows. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, more so assuming that uh, we have uh, like a three to four months more uh, taking from SARS as an example, uh, Back in May 2003, Singapore was declared SARS-free. 
uh, will we be declared SARS uh, more so COVID-19 free in May? Mm -hmm. uh, that's an optimistic view, you know, and if that comes to pass, uh, we may just see a short-term pain maybe in the first half of 2020 and the, and the, uh, and more so the global, and more so the Singapore economy as well, the global economy could actually start its uptrend of uh, again okay. then. Uh, the question we should also ask ourselves really is uh, blockbuster budget, you know, as what UG has put very aptly, uh, 10.9 billion is a huge package. Mm. Uh, back in the last four years of surplus, we actually saw 18.6 billion worth of surplus. Now we are spending about 10.9. We still have money for a supplementary mm. for a supplementary budget if possible, okay. if needed. Mm. You know, so uh, that's 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 from my economic perspective. Given myself as a as a economist by training, uh, it's a good fiscal uh, expenditure to actually help the Singapore economy during this period of time. Yeah, this blockbuster package yeah. really blew away a lot of the <laughs> estimates out there from the economist <laughs> community. Yeah. And the other um, headline I think we saw was the GST being pushed back. Yeah. And this was from uh, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiat saying mm. GST won't be increased in 2021 mm. because we have many external factors around our um, mm -hmm. to consider, especially the economic uh, mm -hmm. activity slowing down. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, just to get your thoughts on what were some of the considerations uh, that went to this decision and what has been some of the feedback you've been getting through the channels from REACH? A key factor in the decision uh, not to go ahead with uh, GST in the next uh, 2021 mm -hmm. is, is really the fact that with the COVID-19 situation, you can tell businesses are feeling pain, and it will have an impact on, on people as well. And we didn't want to add to that. We also looked at the figures and we uh, projected that we can manage. But as Sviket said in Parliament, we can't defer it indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because our population is aging. So our healthcare expenditure is going to rise and we will need recurrent revenue uh, to fund that because it will be recurrent expenditure. But on the other hand, uh, we also want to give Singaporeans the assurance that even at the time when GST goes up, as and when it does, mm -hmm. uh, we will keep costs manageable and affordable. So we set aside $6 billion, that's the assurance package mm -hmm. for GST, to make sure that as and when it kicks in, the government will actually put in $6 billion worth of helping Singaporeans to cope mm -hmm. with the GST. Mm -hmm. um, RJ, I'm curious, you're, you're the tax man. Um, what do you make of this pushing back the tax hike to um, between 2022 and 2025? Does it affect the way that the tax hike gets rolled out? Is 2022 too soon? Are there other factors to consider as we inch towards that deadline? Your thoughts? Sure. So first of all, I think uh, uh, we really appreciate the fact that the budget has pushed the GST because uh, when there is a change in GST rate, it requires businesses to focus on changing their accounting systems, their processes. And I think it's a question of what do we want the businesses to focus on right now? Okay. Uh, do we want them to focus on the immediate crisis in hand uh, in terms of dealing with the situation of COVID-19, getting themselves towards transformation or dealing with the GST rate change? So I'm very, very pleased that it is pushed so that the, the companies do not have to invest that time right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. But be prepared, as the minister said, mm -hmm. that the GST will come in. The other angle that I would like to add is that if we look at it at our other sources of revenue of taxes, the corporate tax, the personal tax rate, uh, we cannot afford to increase them anymore because we will lose our competitive advantage in terms of tax as well. Yeah. Even today, when we look at our copper tax rate, mm -hmm. uh, it is actually very comparable to even UK, mm -hmm. uh, which is at 17%, US, which is at 21%. Uh, so the money has to come from somewhere. And globally, it is also a trend to go towards more consumption tax rather than copper tax and personal tax, uh, who can lose the competitive advantage for the economies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is the right thing to do. Uh, and phasing it out in terms of at a later date, it is the right thing to do at this hour. Uh, yeah. yeah can I get your thoughts from a business perspective? You yeah. know, how does it impact you, whether it's a phased raise, you know, two-phase stage, 1% you know, at a time, or whether it's a one-shot um, injection or hike? Does it affect your business, and which one do you prefer? Mm. Well, I think, you know, if you look at businesses, generally, we don't welcome tax increase. Any business <laughs> tax increase, right? And we can't 
influence that. We did a lot of feedback. And the influence extra bits. But I think in, in the case of businesses, mm -hmm. uh, whether uh, for the last few years, whether it's manpower policy or GST movements, I think businesses appreciate the fact that there is ample notice mm. that's given mm. for businesses, so you have time to plan. A roadmap. Yeah, a roadmap. Mm. Even your CPF increase and all that. You, you sort of have a feel because it's an ecosystem level, macro level move, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And businesses need that advance notice to plan and be able to organize their business properly and prepare for those uh, cost increases. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's quite important to businesses. Of course, you know, uh, they're concerned whether you affect consumption, sales, mm -hmm. but I think those things will sort itself out over time. Mm -hmm. But that's an important point, which is one of the reasons why it was uh, announced earlier um, to basically let the business community know what's, what to expect. Eugene, this is a very real thing because I tried to count the amount of times DPM said 2025. And it's very apparent that us as Singaporeans, we really need to take in that five-year plan, 10-year plan, and adjust to how the economic landscape is changing. What are your thoughts on this? I think if you ask Singaporeans, you know, they, they can probably articulate you know, the, 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 the reasons for, for a tax increase. Um, and, and there is never a good time for a tax yeah. increase. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, that there is that cognitive, what I call the cognitive dissonance, right? You know, because here they see a wealthy country, yeah. A uh, huge amount of reserves, and never mind if we don't know exactly how much. Um, the fact that we have generous budgets that, that enable us to deal with uh, the, the, the difficulties that we may encounter and to plan for the future. Uh, and so the question, you know, I think that, that you hear many or some Singaporeans uh, express is, you know, why the need for, for a tax increase? Um, so, so I think it's, it's something which, um, you know, even though it is raised, uh, you know, two years ago, you'll continue to, to be an issue that, 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 that people get somewhat uh, emotive about sure. uh, because it affects all of us. Uh, and as Kurt says, no one likes um, a tax increase. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the engagement with Singaporeans will have to continue, right? You know, how, how, how these funds um, you know, will be used and, and how they will actually benefit society as a whole. You know, never mind. Um, you know, because you also have the message that you know, the... The, the GST offset package, you know, that you'll probably get more uh, than you would pay. And, and, and then, you know, again, you know, people will ask, so, so why are we having the increase? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, so, so in a way, the, the budget issues have become fairly yeah. complicated, you know, for the ordinary man on the street, in my view. That's a good point, but could I just explain that? Because you see, who pays GST? Uh, you have low income, you have middle income, mm. higher income, and you've got non-Singaporeans who are resident mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and you've got tourists. Everyone, yeah. right? Yeah. The approach we take is that when you raise GST, we'll help the lowest income the most. Middle income will definitely get some. High income get a little bit, but less than the others. Um, and it's the Singaporeans who get the GST uh, assurance package. So in that way, what it means is that we can have the revenue stream come on, but for the ones who need the help most, we will help them. And it's basically for healthcare because the projected increase for our healthcare is about 0.8% of GDP. Hmm. With a 2% increase in GST, you probably get 0.7% GDP. Hmm. So even with a 2% increase, it won't be enough to cover projected healthcare costs for our aging population. Yeah. If yeah. I can add, uh, if you look at the more wealthier countries, uh, the GST rate is much higher than what we have today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that is true. Of course, help is on the way for a lot of workers and businesses uh, impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak and been getting packages like the uh, stabilization and support package, $4 billion worth of help. But there are a few question marks, you know, people are asking, um, what's going to happen from here? Is this going to be enough? And Akut, what are you hearing from the business um, community when you get their so, feedback? Are there any gaps? What do you like about it? So first of all, you know, I've... I've been involved in giving feedback and giving inputs on, on budget and post-budget. And I must say this year, this is probably the most comprehensive budget, forward-looking budget that I've come across. It's very comprehensive in terms of deep tech, innovation, transformation, training of workforce, young, old. All these subject matters all covered. But what businesses worry about really is today, right now. Mm -hmm. So when I look forward, but I'm in the eye of the storm right now, mm. Right? I must stay afloat. And when you come out of a trade war situation and you're facing this massive cash flow situation, mm -hmm. 
So the adjustment of the working capital loans and, and uh, bridging loans, those are going to help to inject liquidity in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But some of the ideas that we are thinking about, because the, the three-month manpower support package uh, of 8%, that might not do very much, although it will help. Uh, and businesses don't really have the luxury of time to say, hey, I wait three months and see what happens yet, because their situation is quite drastic and quite fast yeah. right now. So you're talking about a job support scheme and yes. some people are worried that they might not even so, get around to do So, that. you know, mm. it's all praise for the whole package, but really this part on uh, the assistance of what they need in terms of the, the cash flow situation and the oxygen that they need right now, mm -hmm. this is quite important. And, you know, if we are not fast enough to support uh, some of these, uh, what I call the frontline industries, Mm -hmm. And if they were to have a level of attrition, it's going to affect our vibrancy, actual and visible, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the ideas I thought, like, for instance, if, if we could look at a slightly, slightly longer time frame yeah. of uh, alleviation, like a six months period, uh, so that at least they have a larger breathing uh, space and time to, to sort of regroup and reorganize, uh, and also, um, uh, you know, uh, you know they're willing to play their part to to keep jobs, right? Mm -hmm. However, the the cost and the burden on them right now is really quite heavy. Huh. The we've got feedback from uh, a lot of F and B operators, a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, retail operators that mm -hmm. uh, they are they are hurt quite bad right now, and and. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, this is uh, something which we hope that the government will monitor closely mm -hmm. and uh, uh, step in quite swiftly if the need comes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Johnny, before you get your views, I'm going to get uh, yeah. Barnabas to step mm -hmm. in with uh, economic yeah. perspective. Are you on the same page with... Um, yeah, with? yeah, in fact, I would like to comment on Kurtz. Uh, I mean, part of research work is actually keeping my ears to the ground mm -hmm. and to see where my favorite restaurants are being affected. Uh, I, I, I talk to taxi drivers all the time and, 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 and trust me, they have juicy stories you know, on that. You know, and and, what, and uh, some numbers that I could throw out is uh, depending on various taxi drivers, they did say that uh, given the COVID-19 outbreak, businesses have plummeted. And also, uh, taxi receipts has plummeted as high as 70%. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, yeah, from 50 to 70%. Uh, my favourite restaurant, which I always go to, uh, unfortunately, the restaurant that, 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 that I go to, uh, the, the lady boss has ties with um, tour, uh, most of tour groups. Chinese and, tour and, groups. And, yeah, especially Chinese tour groups. And on good times I go in, there are flags flying around, there were like groups shouting during the tables and, you know, <laughs> they were like, you know, discussing and having fun. Uh, I was there yesterday, I was there today again, it was really empty quiet and I was being and I was speaking to her and she and she did tell me that you know business has fallen. Uh, previously was fifty percent, now it's seventy percent again. You know, so uh, as what Kurt as Epley put as well, you know, that uh, the, the, the pain is here and right now and, and, and this is something that is this is the reality of things. Yeah. But Miss Indrani, this package was put together within a month. Surely there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Am I right to say that? Well you know all of the feedback and the comments that have been given here mm -hmm. is something that the government is actually very much aware of. So we know the pain the businesses are feeling. And mm -hmm. if you think about it, when we started off the year, we didn't have a yeah. COVID-19 mm, package. That's right. mm. We didn't even need to think yes, about yeah. that. Mm. It was our business as, as usual. Yeah. Yeah. And then within the space of Three less weeks. than six weeks, actually, mm. Mm. Uh, we suddenly had to put together mm. this package. Mm. So we looked at what were the most immediate needs, and I think cash flow definitely is, yeah. is one. Um, and that's why we've got the bridging loan. We've mm. also got the, um, the, the corporate tax uh, provisions, property mm. tax. Mm. Um, and this is really, the, the strategy is this. We know that firms are hurting right now. You've seen businesses drop. It's yeah. so quiet. Mm -hmm. So let's deal with the here and now. Give immediate assistance. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, try and save jobs. Okay. Because we don't want companies to suddenly decide, I'm going to let go of my workers now mm -hmm. because I, you know, I've got cash flow problems. Mm -hmm. So the jobs support scheme is really to encourage companies to keep their workers. And at the same time, um, so, so stabilization supports $4 billion worth 
Yeah. I would really encourage the companies to maximize this, make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And the situation is evolving because we don't know, as you say, mm -hmm. whether at the end of three months we just come out of this as we did with SARS or whether it's going to go on a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. sure. But don't forget the 8.3 billion transformation mm -hmm. and growth package because use this time, use this time to do the things that you wouldn't have been able to do uh, in terms of you know, bringing in new productivity measures, sure. make use of the SMEs Go Digital, for example, mm -hmm. make use of all the skills future provisions for mm -hmm. the workers to train so that when we come out of it, which we will, we'll be in a position where we're much stronger. Yeah, and I get your thoughts on this, yeah. Kurt, because uh, you have your year on the ground very closely. So, mm -hmm. What's the situation so like? Is that we really have to dissect into the components itself. Mm -hmm. And there's really two major prongs you have to think about. Because in terms of trade and market, there's not much you can do about it right now because pretty much it's at a standstill. So you've got to look at the cost component and you've got to look at liquidity, right? Cost components, you've got your wages, your rent, your operating costs, and you've got liquidity where you've got your big fall in top line mm. and that has a crunch on your, your liquidity, right? So, you know, the whole question will resolve around is the immediate help sufficient? I think that's what the business community is 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 uh, will ask. Um, Eight percent, three months, and I think the rent mm -hmm. signal, the the ground sentiment is that the rental assistance signal is not substantial enough, mm -hmm. because you're you're giving one month to the hawker, yeah. half month to the HDB mm -hmm. shop operators, mm -hmm. but by and large. The signal that's uh, been given to the SMEs is that, okay, if you are under a government landlord, we'll work with you on flexible uh, repayment, uh, flexible payment schemes, right? Mm. Um, but you must understand that when you have a collapse of your top line by 40 to 60%, and you're still faced with maintaining jobs, rent, and mm. costs, so, you know, that's that's not an easy thing to try and balance, yeah. right? Yeah. In the face of uh, the, in the middle of COVID-19 and, mm. and um, you know, everyone is quite, I think there's some return to an improved level of normalcy right now mm -hmm. in terms of lifestyle and people, but, but you know, uh, three months might not be enough. I think a, a slightly bigger package based on a six months period so that you strengthen them and ready them for any recovery or upswing. The other thing is that when you approach uh, the assistance package from a tax rebate perspective, it really only benefits the companies that are already profitable, mm. right? Okay. But are we in this as an ecosystem, mm. as a whole? Because it's not just profitable companies that are hiring people. Borderline yeah. com profitable companies yeah. are also hiring people. Yeah. Loss-making companies are also hiring people, mm. right? So when you, this is not a, a transformation three, five year journey where you just want to strengthen those that are stronger, you give them the quota, and then as an economy, we, we built it, right? So this is a situation whereby the whole uh, SME ecosystem that hires 70% of the workforce is in it together right now. So the mm -hmm. scale of the, the, the package and the swiftness of it matters. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's some, uh, sentiment that because the the rent assistant uh, is given by the institutional landlords mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trickle down. Mm -hmm. You know, I have no doubts the institutional landlords will trickle it down, yeah. but the process might not be mm -hmm. swift enough, mm -hmm. okay. and the size may not be big enough. Mm -hmm. You know, so so mm -hmm. it is an emotional issue for a lot of SME <laughs> business owners mm -hmm. because business owners put their money where their mouth is, mm -hmm. and you know they they build it according to mm -hmm. their passion, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I what? think. They're not looking at a complete rescue situation. Businesses are part of the solution. There are a lot of good packages out yeah, there. Yeah, they're prepared to pay the cost ready? and be is part of the solution. Is there appetite for it? Because yeah. uh, is there any appetite for all these packages? Is there a hiring freeze and so, for? So I think, okay, I have to comment that the rest of the other side of the budget is very comprehensive and mm -hmm. businesses should really take advantage of that. You've mm -hmm. got SSG Enterprise, $10,000 mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. You've got training for your workforce. Mm -hmm. you, you have a very clear focus on deep tech innovation and a signal for business to keep powering through. And you know, you've got your Go, Go, Go business it. platform to uh -huh. transact mm -hmm. digitally with the government. You know, where it's all praise for that. But I'm just saying that, you know, mm -hmm. A lot of SMEs, they're in the eye of the storm right now. 
Mm. So you know, so just chime in on that as well. Really, from yeah. the economic from the economic perspective, uh, if we just look back in the year twenty nineteen, especially the year twenty nineteen, we had zero point seven percent growth. Okay. But and a big but is that the labor market was still resilient during that period of time. It's a very special slowdown because we actually saw for the full year of twenty nineteen that there was positive employment growth. Mm. There was also positive unit cost of labor growth meaning so wages actually got up, <coughs> potentially. Oh. You know. uh, why am I bringing this in? This is because of the fact that uh, from what we have been hearing from the research perspective is that companies are actually reluctant to retrench workers mm. during a period of time in 2019, given one key assumption, and it's that the U.S. trying to treat tensions mm. will not last for a prolonged period of time. It will start to recover by the end of 2019, and if, we, and if they relinquish their skilled workforce during that period of time, they will run the risk of trying to rehire back again if the thing, if the period turns up, picks up, if the if the economy picks up again. Now, this 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 does mean that they already have gone through a season of so-called pain, whereby they have to cater for a slowdown, but keep their workforce. Mm. And that's the absence of COVID twenty. This this is the absence of COVID nineteen. Mm. Now, with COVID nineteen, mm. and, and nobody expected that to happen. Sure, sure. Is this another season that you have to go through again? That's exactly uh, what the job support scheme yeah. is targeted at mm. because we understand obviously that for SMEs and others, mm. wages is a major component mm. and so the job support scheme is aimed at providing support for wages. Mm. And we, I think we understand mm. you know, the, the concerns of the SME, mm. but there's $4 billion worth out there of mm. stabilisation support. Mm. You, I would say use that first Mm. Use that first and see where it takes us. We'll take this thing one step at a time. Mm. And businesses can be assured that government will be walking every step of the way with them. Um, but rather than say, oh, what about what if uh, further down, let's look, because the package is for the here and now, mm. use that four billion and mm. then, you know, we'll see where we are at in a mm. few months' time. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. uh, Mr. Johnny, of course, I mean, to reflect on what Barnabas said, mm. US trying to trade war, very different when something like this something like a natural disaster steps in. Indeed. It's a very tricky situation. It is, but you know, with all difficult situations, we're Singaporean. We don't sort of fold our, our, uh, our hands and say, oh, we give up, because we don't. Uh, we make sure that we stabilize the situation, which is what the COVID-19 package and the stabilization support package is about. Mm -hmm. But we're, it's also about seeing how we can come out of this sure. uh, and making sure that we're ready for the next, the next mm -hmm. lap. Mm -hmm. I want to open a can of worms and it's got something to do with one of the support packages. Uh, don't have a heart attack yet. Senior worker support package. Mm. Generally, the idea is to encourage more senior workers to stay in work or even pick up part-time work. Uh, Eugene, I'd like to direct this question to you with regard to the senior worker support package. Um, do you think the measures that have been introduced would make businesses more open to hiring older workers? And also, I have noticed a bit of ageism. Mm. Young people bit. come in, I'm being nice. <laughs> Young people come in, more tech savvy, all the people maybe struggling to keep up, take a little bit longer. Uh, but the fact is, we are an aging population. Every year it gets more and more real. What are your thoughts on how this package is going to soften things? I think it will help to companies, you know, to, to see that there are benefits to hiring workers and, and older workers. And one hopes that, you know, when they hire older workers, uh, they see for themselves, you know, the different strengths uh, and, and skill sets that older workers bring. Uh, but I think the big challenge which money will not be able to deal with is mindsets, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The psychological how, how issues. Do, how do you change people's mindsets yeah. about older workers, right? So, so, so the view about, you know, them being, uh, you know, slow to learn, high expectations, can't gel with, with a younger workforce, more demanding. Um, I think we need to tackle that, you know, and, and that's something which um, you know, money uh, may not help. In fact, sometimes when you uh, dangle this carrot before companies, um, you know, then, then the question is, are they doing it because of the money or is it because they, they genuinely believe that um, older workers you know, have a role to play and they can still meaningfully sure. contribute? You know? So, so it's, it, it's, not an, it's not an issue that I think the budget uh, you know, can, can, can tackle. Um, but we need other efforts, you know, in terms of trying to deal with uh, the sort of uh, ages mindsets, you mm. know, that I think 
uh, we see uh, you know, in, in many segments you know, of, of our societies. Ms. Indrani, has, has REACH received any feedback with regard to difficulties that the elderly workforce is facing or the mature workforce is facing? I think it's fair to say that older workers do face more challenges. Of course. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why the budget pitches very targeted assistance there. Um, there are incentives to encourage employers to take on older workers. Okay. But you know, there's also one section of Skills Future which is directed at the group between 40 to 60. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, yes, and because we, we want to make th this, this group, I think, faces more challenges than others. Mm -hmm. And we want them Next. to be able to get jobs, we want them to be able to go into new careers if need be. Mm -hmm. So they, every, everybody gets the $500 top up, they get an additional $500. Mm -hmm. And the idea is for them to be able to use that to upskill uh, or to mm -hmm. learn something new so that they can get into um, a, a new position and also to strengthen the support in terms of career matching mm. and, and helping them to you know, find a new place. Yeah, Ajay and uh, Kurt, so you've, you've heard from Minister the, um, that age group will get extra credits. What sort of skills are employers looking for? What skills should they be upgrading themselves to? So if we look at today, right, uh, digital technology is becoming pervasive, uh, whether it is a technology sector itself or broadly. It is becoming very, very pervasive, so much so that the entire economy is becoming more digital. Uh, we look at any business, they cannot grow, they cannot uh, you know, reach the outcome that they want to reach uh, without adopting di digital technology in one form or the other. Uh, so I think if you look, look at the skill requirement today in businesses, digital is one of the one which is at the top of the agenda in terms of getting the skills from the workers. So if the older workers can really spend that support which is available in terms of equipping themselves more around embracing the digital technologies, learning more about the upcoming technologies or advanced technologies, that would be something that will be very appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see that happening? I, I see it more uh, from the perspective of us as an ecosystem transiting towards an intergenerational workforce. As much as we're trying to uh, update our older workforce with uh, digital skills and, and how transaction happens and connectivity nowadays. At the same time, I think it's also very useful to impart to the younger generation of workforce experience, relationship, mm -hmm. perseverance, mm -hmm. wisdom. Mm -hmm. How do you build connectivity, mm -hmm. personal connectivity, right? So I, I see it more in terms of how we uh, develop a, a, a complex mix of strength and how do you move that as an ecosystem. So the, the work that WSG and SSG does do is, is really meaningful from my perspective because it prepares a generation of, of workforce uh, to, to go forward with relevance. And, you know, so, mm -hmm. so those assistance schemes are very important because it helps businesses in mm -hmm. transiting into it, ready for the cause, and a bit of carrot incentive for you to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to mm -hmm. change and, and, and be progressive and transform towards this new ecosystem, right? And so, mm. yeah. yeah, the new way of the world really is to constantly transform if you want to stay relevant or even ahead of the curve, if that's even possible. Mm. Uh, Mr. Johnny, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because I remember DPM saying how year 2019, and forgive me if I've gotten the numbers wrong, 49% of Singaporeans have taken up the Skills Future uh, credits. Mm -hmm. um, it is less than 50%. Uh, Ryan, for example, took up the five hundred dollars to go for acting classes. Just want to put it out there in case acting it's classes a movie okay. role. We're going to diversify a skill set. <laughs> <laughs> what is the sentiment uh, received by Reach in terms of this, this skills future? I think generally the sentiment is positive. Sometimes people don't utilize it because they're already busy in their, their current job, yeah. so they may not need it, and they'll mm -hmm. think, okay, I, I want to save this for some time in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually one of the reasons why, for this round, we wanted it to be spent in the next five years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we, we want people to take advantage of it to, to mm -hmm. upskill and, and, and learn something new. Uh, so, generally speaking, uh, the reaction is positive. Um, but not everybody acts on it immediately. It's kind of like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll save it for, for, for later. So some of them feel that way. There's another psychological barrier in that sense, mm -hmm. Eugene. I'm, uh, say, I'm a young dad, I got kids at home, I got a full-time job, I manage a team. Why? Go and upgrade myself. Oh, great. So, so the question yeah. is, you know, you, you, there is this opportunity, uh, you know, to upskill, uh, but then there, there could be systemic issues that prevent 
uh, a person from accessing right. mm -hmm. the opportunities. You know? So, so they're, they're two quite different things. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think when you look at the skills future uh, ecosystem, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, you, um, the, it'd be interesting to, to, to find out how people view it uh, and, and, and whether you know, it really is a, an, a, a means by which people can secure better jobs. Sure. Right, because when, given that the society still prizes um, academic qualifications, um, you know, the question is, you know, mm. a six-month uh, course which doesn't lead to any qualification, uh, maybe just a mere certification, you know, how many employers are really prepared to do that? You know? mm. So it's, it's, it's not a, a, an issue with skills future per se, you know, to be clear. Okay. Mm. Um, the question is, you know, how do we get our employers to recognise Okay. Uh, you know, people who are willing to, to learn new things, mm -hmm. you know, who, who show that nimbleness, that adaptability. Mm -hmm. Because you can have someone who go for all these courses, right? Um, you know, and then they go out to the job market, but the job market is not prepared to recognise, you know, that effort, you know, that, that attempt to be resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's where uh, you will have a lot more disappointment well, coming the, in. The thing is, though, that skills future cannot be seen in isolation. That's one part of it, but it has to be seen together with the entire slew of adapt and grow. So there's, there's another component of it, which is basically encouraging employees to take in people uh, to train them, or, for example, when they are trained, then to employ them. So it should be seen side by side, mm. but it's, mm -hmm. it's like a... It, it's, it's, it's basically a starter thing, is to get people s started on yeah, learning the new Yeah, definitely. Skills. But I, I think, you know, the sense is, you know, employers want, uh, you know, uh, employees who can come in and plug and play straight away, you know, so the idea ah. that, you know, That's so, so again, right, again, it's, yeah. it's got nothing to do with skills future and all. You know, the, the question is, you know, how can our employers, you know, rise to the occasion as well, you, you know, so that, you know, with all these resources, um, you know, um, that are available to the individual worker, uh, they can leverage on them and, mm. and, and actually benefit the companies. And you know? so it's a mindset change, a total it is, sort of societal it is. and uh, economy mm. mindset change. Uh, I guess that's where things like professional conversion program comes in. You Absolutely. Know, uh, WSG and now you have SSG Enterprise as well. You know, yes. So some of these other additional uh, legs of support are helpful. Mm. So I think if I can chime in, uh, mm. what it is definitely a mindset thing, mm. but the enterprises have to also look at what do we have as an economy, as a country to offer? Mm. Skills is the biggest component of it. Yeah, and that, the region, the globe is looking at us in terms of giving us, giving the new skills. Be it is in sustainability, whether it is in transformation and so on and so forth. Mm. So like one, one of the things the enterprises could also be looking at, uh, you know, how do we create those skills not only for the Singapore market, uh, which is definitely a smaller market, but creating those skills to be exported outside Singapore to make it a more sustainable uh, business for themselves and in the run, make it for the whole economy as well. And I think that is something which could help in terms of uh, propagating that more as to how do you really build those skills, not, not, not only to serve the consumers here, okay. uh, which is a small population, but the world out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'm glad that the minister used that terminology to make Singapore as a global Asia node of technology, innovation and enterprises. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, message has to be well understood, yeah. uh, has to be adopted and has to be used more mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Barnabas, from my view, how yeah. do you see this you know, closing mm -hmm. the gap between what employers want and what mm -hmm. the skills are available out there? Yeah, perfect question. That was what I was about to say. Yeah, I think uh, I had the privilege of speaking to the food handler just now, uh, back uh, while I was uh, while having a meal. Uh, he's 40 years old, and uh, he actually did say that uh, he understood that there was an additional $500 credit for uh, all skills physics credit, given the fact he's between 40 and 60. You know, uh, So I asked him, will you be using it? He thought for about it for two seconds, and the answer was like, an, I don't know, maybe no. So why? Oh. Why? Why? And he said that, oh, because uh, he doesn't know what to do. He hasn't, any, there's nothing that caught his eye. That was his exact phrase. There's nothing caught his eye. So that brings issue number one, ignorance, whereby there's, 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 there's little avenue as to what people could actually go to and mm. retrain themselves as one. Okay. Secondly, secondly and, I, and I did propose to him, what if the skills futures credit is being packed to a job certainty, whereby a company will use, will, 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 will train you, but you use the skills futures credit that 
the government has given to you. And that packs to a job certainty. Mm. And he actually nodded and said, yeah, maybe that, that sounds yeah. better. And, and, and that, that, that basically gives the worker clarity. Right. An incentive. And, and incentives. Like, I do not know what's there out there for me, but if there is this job offer that says that I need this skill, doesn't matter if you don't have this skill, we will give you the training. Skills Futures credit will be used. And on the basis that you clear the training with certification and stuff like that, if possible, the job is yours. So th that's in yeah. fact the approach already used for mm -hmm. adapt and grow. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting suggestion to see mm -hmm. how we can also help them to think of the Skills Future Credit as part and parcel yeah. of that process. Mm -hmm. And I'm very sure that a lot of the older workers who is listening to us right now uh, <laughs> would also relate as to what's there for me. Is that what are the avenues out there for me? Is there a government portal that I could go to to see a list of courses okay. only meant for six forty to sixty? Right. You know, yeah, fair enough, yeah. Um, I want to take us to a topic that was highlighted by our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong at last year's National Day rally and we saw a real follow-up this year with our Deputy mm -hmm. Prime Minister talking about the new Coastal and Flood Protection Fund, an initial injection of $5 billion, uh, to protect against rising sea levels and that fund can be topped up subsequently whenever our fiscal situation allows. Uh, I'll leave Ryan to talk about the fiscal situation but uh, Ms Indrani, I'd like to hear from you with regard to feedback collected by REACH. Are Singaporeans now, more than ever, especially after what our Prime Minister said, are they realising the importance of climate change sustainability? Yes, I think the um, awareness of the need to deal with climate change is much higher today than it was, you know, even two, three, four years ago. Um, it's something which the young people uh, are very seized yeah. with, mm -hmm. um, but Singaporeans as a whole, I think you find, uh, are quite environmentally conscious. Mm. We were the original garden city, right? Uh, we did tree planting long before this idea of mm. having to reforest places and plant trees mm. uh, came up. Mm. Um, simply because of our small size and we, we know that we're vulnerable to, to various things. So I, I think awareness among Singaporeans is high um, and support for wanting to do something is also high. Um, but at the same time, it's a question of what, what should, should we do. So there are big pieces which yeah. government has to do. One is coastal protection. Yeah. The other is raising the, the level of Singapore so that you bring it above the rising sea level. But we also know, are very conscious that people themselves want to do something. So that's why we set aside money in the Eco Fund mm -hmm. uh, so that people can have initiatives on their own. You can have ground up community sure. initiatives and everybody can have a sense of ownership to do something. Mm. We're a hub for just about everything these days. What about Singapore as a potential sustainability hub? Absolutely, because it's actually a new industry, mm -hmm. if you think about it. For infrastructure, if you, if you build something, you want to make sure that it's eco-friendly, that the materials that are used are eco-friendly, that the system is en you know, energy efficient. So services in the sustainability area, ESG, Environmental Governance Services, that's something which I think is is a growth area for us. Um, we're an infrastructure hub and we can tap on that. We've got this whole sort of cooling Singapore uh, initiative. Yeah. We want to have, uh, Minister Masagos is, is pushing yeah. zero waste. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot that we can do um, to be an example for, for mm. the rest of the world in addition to making sure that we set the gold standard for ourselves. Mm. So this is something um, Prime Minister Lee Sen Dong has said, it'll take 100 <laughs> years and 100 billion dollars to address how are we going to fund this? Do you have any ideas or suggestions? Are we in a good fiscal position to address this? Well, a very, uh, I mean, if you're looking back in past budgets and as, as to how much, why are you laughing at me? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, I mean, on past budgets when uh, I have been reading the budgets uh, all the way since history, you know, and uh, do, you, do you know that uh, in, in, on, at budget 2002, uh, there was actually a mention to say that there was a goal to actually keep the cost, cost of government be, below 20% of GDP, you know, and right. I'm proud to say that the Singapore government has been prudent in the sense that the cost of government or more so total expenditure has been below 20% ever since uh, the history has shown since public data was available. Why they're bringing this up is because of the fact that uh, in order to answer your question about whether Singapore has the monies to deal with it, a quick answer would be yes, given first and foremost the prudency that, that the government has already shown since history. I'm not talking about one, two, three years. I'm talking about mm. since the budget was made available. 
back in throughout history. You know, that's one. And two, given the last five years, uh, this year is the fifth year of, uh, of, 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 of the budget cycle, we have huge budget surplus. And there has always been a budget balance in history as well. So a, good, a, a quick answer is five, five, uh, uh, the, 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 the funds that's been used right now uh, to actually slated to actually do environmental issues, uh, it is important mm -hmm. given rising sea levels. And I'm confident that the, Singapore, that the Singapore government could actually see to have enough funds to actually help. It's, it's, it's just, just a quick, yeah. quick point on that. So the, the way we're doing it is mm -hmm. basically saving the money. Mm -hmm. That's why you take the five billion that we have, mm -hmm. because now we've got some extra. Take five billion, you put in the fund, and then going forward, as in when we have surpluses, we'll put it in the fund. Mm -hmm. So this way, we build up the, the resources to mm -hmm. be able to deal with it. So you're putting over the first deposit years. first. Mm -hmm. Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, if I can offer a slightly different perspective, mm -hmm. uh, look at the budget uh, statement this year. Out of the 11 billion deficit that we are creating, 5 billion is coming because we are setting aside the money for the coastal fund, as mm -hmm. the minister said. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, we don't know what the uh, GDP growth in the future years and all are going to look like. But the key question we should be asking ourselves is, uh, do we just need to count on budget to keep aside mm -hmm. the fund for the sustainability or out of which, as you rightly said, create an industry out of it. Yeah. Mm. So that you know our enterprises can build the skill set and help many other coastal cities around the world mm. uh, to help them in tackling with this climate change issue mm. for them. And from there, make more profits, give more money to the workers, mm. and thereby increase the revenue base for the economy. So that it becomes a self-sustainable circular model on its own, mm. rather than looking year after year at the budget, uh, because we don't know. We have many uh, aspects to deal with: yeah. healthcare, infrastructure, social needs, and on top of that is sustainability. Mm. Yeah. So you know, it's another way to look at it: uh, whether the budget can really do it, or we need to create a New growth solution. Industry. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. To go always have your parents bail absolutely. you out. Mm. Kurt. So you'll see the beginnings of that with the Green Towns program. Mm. Yes. Mm. Before I get to Kurt, Eugene, you have some thoughts? No, I, I, I like the initial $5 billion commitment. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that you know, our approach to climate change would be very much the way we take to defense and education, sure. right? making consistent annual investments. Right? So, we, so we now make, uh, I was a bit somewhat surprised when, when uh, DPM said that, well, if there are surpluses. Um, you know, but if we see it as you know, a, a national priority, uh, then I think it becomes important okay. to continually uh, invest in it. Um, and of course, there are issues about intergener intergenerational equity, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are, in, we are preparing for the future. And so, you know, the present generation may feel yeah. that they need not invest in it. Mm. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think we shouldn't make too much of it, you know, simply because, you know, I wouldn't want my son, you know, to, 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 to grow up in a Singapore mm -hmm. that, is, that is increasingly sinking. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think we, we, we shouldn't make too much of it, but certainly you know, there must be a, a portion that is paid by future generations. But I, but I hope we, we, we do it you know, through a consistent investment, you know, not when there are surpluses. Um, you know, I, I think if we think that it's important enough, uh, then I think we should find the funds for it, just, just like we do for defence, for education and now healthcare. I think we should adopt the same sort of attitude mm -hmm. uh, you know, towards uh, dealing with climate change. Just Particularly when we don't know how quickly it's going to hit us. Exactly. We don't know how much we need to invest. Um, so I think you know, now when times are good, we should really uh, you know, get us to a good hit start. Mm -hmm. Fair point. The eh? saving is yeah. for the big, lumpy, big expenditure. But the ministry's um, operation, yearly operational budget will be also deployed for this. So if you think about it, the Green Towns program, that, that's part of it, making every town uh, yes. green and eco-friendly. And then don't forget the infrastructure that Ministry of Transport is going to put in place um, for electric vehicles mm. because we're trying to make that switch over to green energy. So you'll see that mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a whole slew of measures and then on top of that, the fund. Mm. But those measures, they are really long-term measures. I mean. The EV ones is a tricky one because infrastructurally we really need to build it up. Mm -hmm. uh, the HDB Green Towns program, you know, you're talking about reducing energy consumption, mm -hmm. recycling rainwater, cooling HDB towns. That's right. um, I want to I want to close it off with Kurt um, on two points. First, um, can businesses see themselves adopting to such measures, and and what are you hearing from businesses? Where does sustainability rank on their priorities? 
I think there is already an emerged group of entrepreneurs that are in a sustainable enterprise, whether it's farming, uh, solar energy, you know, and, and various uh, future industries. They are already in this space. Uh, I do come across some very exciting companies in the SME space. I'm sure you all heard of uh, Sunsip. Mm. And I know of another quiet operator that's emerging. Uh, they have a lot of patents around uh, urban farming. And you know, we've got some of uh, very impressive uh, fishery, modern uh, yeah. fishery technology is actually in Singapore, right? Mm. Uh, not many people realize that we are actually, uh, we have a, a fish farm in uh, Samakau and we're selling yeah. fish back to the Australians. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. It's Barramundi. So, right? Yeah, Barramundi, right? Andrew Kwan, Barramundi. So we've got some exciting uh, enterprises that are emerging in this space. Mm. I think it will be powered by uh, the next generation of the young that are very, as mm. Minister said, very seized about uh, sustainable enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, it is very good actually to see policy now in place for what potentially something that may happen in 50 or 60 years because this is, we invest in our people, mm. we invest in our country and, and you know, climate mm. is something that's really, really important in our subject matter. Mm. I've actually followed out of personal interest for about 15 years, the subject of climate change. Oh. Okay. And mm -hmm. the impacts are actually nearer to us by the year. You know, it used to be 80, 100 years, and now they say 60, 70 years. And mm -hmm. so, so it's really, really important that you know, we, we start investing and build these ideas in our young and, and we move towards mm -hmm. this direction. I mean, we, we haven't seen this yet in Singapore, but I think the climate change issue comes at a very, very apt time, given the fact that we have saw regional uh, problems. Do we have droughts in Thailand? We have floods in Indonesia. We bush have bush fires, fires yeah. in Australia, yeah. and that bam comes the Singapore budget, whereby there is uh, there's the, the 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 green initiative, and, and it, that was that was in the, the the budget. So I think perfect timing. Yeah. We do have some questions coming in from Facebook, so I'm gonna just bring out one of them, and this is about you know I know budget tries to please everyone, but you can't uh, include everybody, all the demographics <laughs> inside one budget. Uh, Barnabas, your thoughts, are there anything, any demographics, mm -hmm. groups of people that you think can be looked at down the road? Um, I think the one thing that we, I have been considering when I was still doing my budget preview is the issue of the sandwich generation. Mm. I think uh, what we have seen and, uh, and, 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 and I'm really thankful for it is that the medical fees of my parents have been largely covered for given the Pioneer Generation and the Modaka Generation mm. package that was being rolled out. Uh, uh, well, I was speaking to some people and they did say, okay, so what's next? What is the next <laughs> health package right now? <laughs> I said, no way it's going to have another health package given that a lot of a, a, a good part has been covered right now. So, but with the Wayne class right now, we do have uh, a good uh, health, uh, or more so the, the, the top part of the sandwich has been much largely catered for. Um, the bottom part, I know uh, there's, 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 there's always, uh, uh, I think there's childcare benefits as well as uh, primary school subsidies and stuff like that's already in place right now. Can, it, can more can be done mm. with them, you know, and, and, and stuff? So uh, I think this is one, one, one aspect, one group of people that I could actually bring, bring mm. up to, yeah. I think it's a good question for the rest of you to chime in as well. Yeah. Eugene, do you have any thoughts on any mm -hmm. areas that could be looked at a bit more closely? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in terms of age group, I, I, I certainly look at, take the view that those in their 50s uh, you know, may require special attention. Not because I'm in that age group, right? <laughs> um, you know, but certainly when you look at the sort of issues that, that they face, um, you know, particularly when, when they start to work um, uh, and, and the, the salaries they're getting then and then the cost of living now. Um, I think it's something which, uh, you know, would be helpful in terms of some retirement assurance, right? So, so I, I certainly hope the CPF would be relooked with some amount of, uh, you know, um, rigour, um, you know, because I, I know it's not meant to be the only source of retirement funds, mm -hmm. uh, but I think many Singaporeans still rely heavily on it. And, and the question is, you know, can we... Uh, can we get more bang out of it, um, you know, given the, the amount of resources that are put into it? Um, so, so that to me is, is something, um, you know, because we don't want a situation where, you know, increasingly when I see peers in my age group, you know, the concern about what's going to happen, you know, when, when they retire. I mean, my university has already indicated when my, you know, when my 
when my retirement date is, you know, it, it, that kind of shocked me, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I suppose it's a reality. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, it's, it's beginning to, to dawn on many of us in, in, in my age group that, um, you know, are we really prepared for, for it? Um, you know, yeah. so, so it's, it's a personal responsibility, of course, you know, but I think it's something which uh, some retirement assurance, uh, I think, you know, that would benefit uh, generations of Singaporeans would be, would be very helpful. Mm. Yeah, retirement is definitely a rising concern. Also impacts other decisions like having kids and whatnot. Mm. Uh, RJ, your thoughts from yeah. Your so I'll, I'll switch the gear around sustainability and technology. Um, I think we have done uh, good efforts in sustainability, but one area uh, where we could see more is around the green building initiative. Uh, our buildings almost emit one fourth of the carbon that we emit in the atmosphere. Uh, so I I would hope that the budget uh, going forward can address mm. more green building initiative transforming our old buildings into green buildings and mm. providing support for prop tech solutions as well. So those solutions can be used in the current environment, but it can also be used beyond Singapore. Mm. And the second aspect is around 5G. Uh, 5G is coming mm. and it is going to be pervasive in terms of the, or it's going to be a catalyst for uh, technology innovations and solution, solutions. Uh, so how the budget can do more in terms of making 5G technology more pervasive and mm. affordable uh, for companies to use. Uh, those will be my two asks, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I think, you know, I have to, first of all, I have to recognize the Minister of Finance for having a budget that's very clear and consistent on how he wants to continually architect the economy, digitalization, globalization, and there's a lot of uh, targeted initiatives towards how we're going to build into what he called, you know, global Asia note, but at the same time, overseas marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I hope to see a lot more bold initiative towards how we can extend to build uh, economic centers overseas for our businesses to be able to go there mm. and flourish. Mm. Uh, so mm. if you're a business mm. owner and you know, you're building your business and, and you know, there is uh, highways towards 10 markets overseas besides the Singapore market, right? then you know your playing field is a lot bigger. Mm. And you don't have to go to all 10 markets, but you can mm. choose two or three markets mm. where you can try and flourish with. There's a lot, already a lot of support services uh, uh, and set up and assistance mm. in those domestic markets there for you. And there's a friendly culture there. So uh, building economic centers outside of Singapore is quite important for us to diversify and for mm. us to actually flourish. So I hope to see more mm. towards that area. And so it's also a solution towards some of our recurring problems of, of, of a small market and how we need that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Johnny, just to wrap up with you, COVID-19 certainly has presented a potential crisis. And I think with budget, it's shown how, and it's also a message for all of us as Singaporeans to turn that crisis into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, it's no secret that by April next year, there's going to have to be a, an election. This budget, does it represent a strong statement in the kind of leadership moving forward, the kind of thought process moving forward into the election, into the next uh, seated government. Your thoughts? This budget is really a statement that Singaporeans are first and foremost our priority. So if you think about every single part of the budget, it's about putting Singaporeans first and seeing how we can move forward as a country, which is why the budget title is Advancing as One Singapore. So we've got a crisis, We've got the COVID, the, the stabilization and support package to deal with it. At the same time, we're, we want to make sure that our workers stay employed. We want to make sure that our companies grow. We've got the transformation and growth package. We want to make sure that our families are taken care of. Um, so you've got the nurture and support part. And we want to make sure that we're set for the future. So this budget is very much about making sure that Singapore grows and prospers. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that I, I take on board all the, the comments that, um, you, you know, uh, uh, colleagues here have given mm. because that's part of the Singapore Together approach. Mm. So every, everything that you've, you've mentioned today, um, we'll, we'll take on board and we'll see how mm. we can work that into future budgets, whether it's mm. next year or years after that. And that's how we built Singapore. It's built on the strength of the ideas of Singaporeans and make, making sure that our budgets support that. Mm -hmm. We want to thank everyone for joining us on the panel this afternoon. Ms. Indrani Raja, of course, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister for Finance and Education. Together with Manabas Gan, Economist at United Overseas Bank. Ajay Sangraneria, who is Deputy Head of Tax at KPMG. Kurt Wee, President of ASME and Chairman, SBF SME Committee. Eugene Tan, Associate Professor of Law, Singapore Management University. And of course, thank you very much for joining us for this post-Budget 2020 panel on Facebook Live. Uh, I'm Elliot Dagg. 
Packard together with Ryan Huang from the Best Breakfast Huddle here at Money FM 89.3.